everybody. This is Raul with Bass Musician Magazine. And today we've got a great honor and pleasure of having a Skype interview with bassist for the Revivalist, George Gickus. Hello, Internet. Hi, everybody. <laughs> there you Thanks. go. So, George, kind of so that the readers can get to know you, let's start from the beginning on your bass journey. I understand, if I remember correctly, you were a saxist. You played sax before you played... Uh, bass yes i started i guess like a lot of kids they came around school and see all if anybody wanted to play instruments to get kids kind of interested in performing like concert bands stuff like that so i started playing alto in the fourth grade and i played that all the way throughout high school doing that in jazz combo and stuff like that but mostly just in a concert setting. But eventually in high school, I switched over to the baritone saxophone, and that kind of started my journey on like the low end, so to speak. So I was around 14 or 15 when I actually picked up the bass guitar, and as soon as I did, I realized like this is by far the instrument I want to play. Not that there's nothing against saxophone. I love saxophone, mm -hmm. and I love a lot of great sax players, and it's definitely added to some of my playing with the melodic sensibilities that the instrument has. But, yeah, I, I switched from saxophone to bass, and I've definitely met some other guys, too, that have done that. It's not just me. So. Gotcha. Well, my son is a sax player. Yeah. And, and so it, it's part of the reason that I actually ended up starting bass because we were working on getting him all geared up. And yeah, he, yeah. He plays vintage horns. Oh, so wow. he's playing a Con 10M 1955, uh, the Naked Lady horn, the one that has the engraved Naked oh. Lady on the bell. Nice. And uh, we were so busy getting him stuff, I thought, you know, I've always wanted to play bass. So I think I, I will start with that. And here we here we go years later. But moving along, you you took up, you know, in your teen years, started playing bass. Mm -hmm. and, and then what happened? So... Uh, like a lot of guys that just started playing out with friends. It wasn't a situation where like, you know, a lot of guys get together with buddies like, oh, we need a bass player. Mm -hmm. I was not one of those guys. I definitely wanted to play bass. Like coming up, my parents listened to a lot of different music. Like specifically, my dad listened to a lot of Motown. And obviously, I think that resonated with me somehow just driving the car and constantly listening to like those Babbitt and Jamerson lines, stuff like that. And my mom, on the other hand, um, she listened to a lot of Beatles, Steely Dan, Earth, Wind and Fire. So there was definitely all this stuff that cultivating that I had no idea until later in my life that was like, oh, there's a reason why this is probably resonating with me the way it does. Mm -hmm. So coming up through high school, you know, I was listening to a ton of great rock bands, Led Zeppelin, stuff like that, Chili Peppers, a lot of like really great bass driven bands at the time, like 311 and Incubus, guys were just like creating really good grooves. And playing around town and wherever we could in a bunch of high school bands. And eventually I had the opportunity to have a scholarship and come down to school in New Orleans and I took it. And originally my interest was gonna be in the music industry. I came down to New Orleans to Loyola University to do their music business program. And long story short, I, I started playing with some friends and 10 years later we're here. You so I, I will say I'm excited to be on the performance side of the industry. Not that there's anything against the the actual industry, but uh, I'm I'm living a dream right now, man. I can't complain. Gotcha. Well, it's it's good to know a little something about everything. I mean, you can't yeah. you can't separate the business side with the music side. No, um, absolutely not. And unless I don't know. You live in some remote place and you just play yeah. and you know, real real zen, I guess, kind of living off the grid or something. But New Orleans especially, New Orleans, is a uh, very music-rich environment as well. So uh, this group, you, the Revivalists, tell us a little bit about the music that, that you guys play. So, oh man, we're... We're kind of all over the place, but we definitely consider ourselves a rock band first and foremost. And we never sought out to say, hey, you know what, we need to have certain sensibilities on certain songs and certain parts. It's always a culmination of seven different individuals putting their creative input into a group. And it's always been that for us. It's never been the fact that we have like a, a steel guitar player 
and a couple horns outside of a traditional rock setting. It's just more that these are the individuals and this is the way they speak through their particular instrument, their personality. But we have definitely sensibilities with soul. There's some folk stuff going on. There's some straight up rock going on. There's some funk stuff going on, almost like electronic tinges in certain points. And we're never afraid to explore anything as long as we think the song is good. We're willing to try anything and do whatever that needs to be done to have the jaw of the song given justice. So, gotcha. Now, with some of the sounds of New Orleans, of course, you have a lot of exposure to jazz yes. and you know some of the, the the Zydeco Cajun kind of stuff. Um, I actually spent a uh, a summer at, <laughs> at, at Tulane. Oh, nice. And while I was there, I got to meet the Neville brothers, and so certainly some amazing music in new orleans do you pull from those surroundings yeah absolutely it's it's something that comes up a lot and we to be honest there's it's impossible not to have that so when you're playing mm -hmm. i know especially in terms of bass when i first came down here like i really didn't know much about the jazz world and the funk world and now i'm incredibly blessed to live in a city that not only cultivates it and encourage it, but it's the birthplace of an American art form. You know yeah. what I mean? So for us, New Orleans is, it's just, it sounds cliche, but it's a melting pot. There's, it's the only place I've been to where I can walk outside my house and there will be a jazz funeral with 300 people going by. You can go out any night of the week and not only see people, but experience the community aspect. That's what it is down here. People care about each other and want to see each other do well, want to learn and, and listen to great music. And I'm just fortunate enough that in this town there is a plethora of amazing players and amazing bands and musicians, and it's it seeps in your soul. There's no way it couldn't. And we're fortunate enough to have that happen to us by living in here and getting to experience it consistently, uh, the possibilities of what happened down here. Gotcha. And what, what does the band, what do you guys have going on? You have, Playing locally, have any tours planned, uh, CDs? We are always touring. <laughs> so we, we are currently touring off our album. It's called Men Amongst Mountains. And as I say, today is uh, Thursday. We're going to be on Conan on Monday. Cool. So we're doing that for our, our single, Wish I Knew You. But we're we're constantly touring. We're, we're a live band. We love making great albums in the studio, but we definitely thrive and want to play live as much as we can we tour throughout the entire united states do some international but we'll be doing a lot of dates february through the rest of the year and you'll you can check out our website to see them got you and just so people know what website should they it's the revivalist.com revivalist.com gotcha um something that always comes up and i can't help but to notice the base behind you we always got to talk a bit about gear Absolutely. Talk to us about your gear. What are what are your weapons of choice? Gear, I, I have. I'll show you. I have, this some of this is home gear. For instance, like this. I've had this since high school, and this is just uh, a Mexican PJ, which I always thought was interesting because you don't see a lot. I'm trying to get in the camera. Here you go. I don't see a lot of PJ, and this thing, like the neck, is all messed up. And it doesn't particularly sound great, but when I'm trying to work on like dexterity and stuff, it's not plugged in. Uh -huh. It's for me to practice on this, because then when I switch to the, any bases I play, I can fly. So this is more of just like a, a workout base, so to speak. A trainer. <laughs> yeah. Let's see, I have that there. This is, let me tilt the camera better. This is a D'Angelico EX base that they were kind enough to give me. It's got really cool proprietary pickups and a really cool headstock. And I use this. This is only has flats, always has flats. And I'm trying to figure out a way to start bringing to the live repertoire. But for my home recording, I use this all the time. It sounds amazing. Yeah, okay. More bass just in the house. And this is my American jazz base that I got about 10 years ago. And I have the Badass 3 bridge on it, which is, makes an absolute world of difference. This is, if you have a Fender bass, you need, or a Fender style bass, you need to put one of these on. Gotcha. And it's sustained for days. And that's, this is all standard. But, DR strings. <laughs> my DR strings here. And I'm also a proud 
endorser of Warwick bass. So I have a Warwick Corvette, and that's I've been playing that. I've had that since I was 16. That's my baby. That's the most comfortable and best sounding bass that I get to play. It just feels like home. Gotcha. Gotcha. And amplification wise, uh, Eden, if I remember correctly. Now I'm uh, I'm currently using Mesa gear right okay. now. Okay, Mesa. Tim, Tim from Mesa has been kind enough to let me try out some of their stuff, and I'm actually the big tour we go on in February. I'll be using all Mesa gear. Sweet, so, sweet. Yeah. I do have a quick question. With the bridge, this is kind of always an interesting conversation yes. we have, because again, a lot of times. I think people play with whatever stock, and the the first thing that I think people will change on a bass is the pickups. True. Because they'll go, oh, I got to get better better pickups. But yeah. when you changed your bridge, how did you how do you feel that that affected the the sound? Oh man, I I was doing research where because the bass is passive to begin with, mm -hmm. there's only a certain amount of I don't know like resonance that it can have. And it's something I would not really notice as much until you went to a studio setting with really nice preamps and mic set up where I know that I have certain basses that are active that could just have sustained for days and like the tone is super clear and get everything you want. So I went on like talk bass and started looking up certain mods for just my American jazz bass mm -hmm. and bridge was coming up a lot. So I looked into it, and then I saw that there were a ton of different options to go for, and I picked one, and it just, like I said, it makes a world of difference. And it's not a huge change, and I'm sure everybody out there has really good, um, like, luthiers and people that can put great setups on their bass. Sure. And it only took about an hour, and I can't tell you how much better it sounds for not a huge undertaking for it to do. It's not like you're refretting the fingerboard or anything crazy. It's... Uh, I'll put it this way, any Fender style bass that I get, I'm definitely probably gonna put one of those badasses on, so. Nice, well, and of course, I think always the, the fear when it comes to working on your own instrument is that you take off the stock bridge and discover that the holes on the new one don't line up with the holes yeah, of the old that, one. That is a huge issue, you have to make sure, that's one thing <laughs> they'll, they'll try and note to you that, hey, if you have a particular, like, especially with a Fender American bass from these particular years, you have to have it set up right, otherwise you're gonna take it off and then realize you're not gonna be playing that bass for a while. There, there you go. Or you're trying to figure out where to put new holes and you're like, exactly, oh, yeah. I don't wanna I don't wanna drill on this thing. Definitely not. Totally. Well, George, um, as as always, we are thrilled to get to meet a, a brother bassist in, in, in the world. Uh, certainly getting a chance to hear you guys and share your music uh people that are hearing this you get the opportunity the revivalists uh keep your eye on their website catch them on conan if you stay up uh yep. late i guess i'm not sure what time he's on uh getting old i, I tend to fall asleep yep. before before that stuff goes on but uh also keep your eye out for recordings and more music from from george uh awesome. do, do you have any parting words of wisdom you'd like to share with upcoming bassists? Oh, man. Constantly be learning. And there's always going to be somebody who is either more well-versed in theory, more technically proficient, has a better ear. Can There's always something to learn from somebody else. And, and don't be afraid to ask because if you don't ask for help and you don't seek it out, you're never going to get it. Not that you can't do it on your own, but you definitely learn and grow through more people. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to uh, to be a community guy, like the way we're talking right now. It's going to help you learn, make become better, because that's essentially everybody wants the same thing. Everybody wants to get better, and everybody's on their own journey. So I would say never stop learning and seek out help when uh, when you want to and need to. Very cool. Well, you heard it here, folks. George Geekus with the Revivalists here on Bass Musician Magazine. Thanks again, George. Thank you, Raul.